What if I told you that every year the world's most influential leaders gather in the woods to worship a 40 foot tall owl statue? It's called the Bohemian Club, and it's a secret society comprised of the most influential people in the entire world. The Bohemian Club was founded in 1872, and it was originally just a group of artists and musicians, just very artistic types of people. But today's Bohemian Club is a far cry from what it originally was. Like most secret societies, with the exception of a few, it's male only. The current waiting list is 15 years and the membership fees are $25,000. Now this is especially crazy, the $25,000 membership, when one considers that they only use Bohemian Grove two weeks out of the year. Their motto is Weaving Spiders Come Not Here from Shakespeare. And this is because the club is supposed to be a retreat for these powerful men. But national policy is often made through networking, including choices about who will be the next president. One person has ever successfully snuck in. This is part two of talking about Bohemian Grove. And in this part, we're gonna talk about the ritual opening ceremony and the only person that's ever successfully broken. Maybe you've heard of him, his name is Alex Jones. Bohemian Grove is a retreat for the very rich and the very powerful. And for two weeks of the year, they gather in the California Redwoods and they start their two weeks of partying by worshiping at the feet of a giant owl statue, which is by the way, 40 feet tall. The ceremony is called the Cremation of Care. And it's a ceremony that's been going on for over a hundred years. Former member Walter Cronkite's voice echoes from inside the giant owl and fires burn all around this giant statue that's meant to represent knowledge and the pursuit of it. A carriage pulled by black horses arrives carrying a casket and an effigy. Members are meant to put their cares inside and burn it. Alex Jones snuck into Bohemian Grove. And while he's a polarizing figure, this is a true story. This is the footage that Alex Jones secretly recorded at the opening ceremony, the cremation of care. Since Alex Jones' proverbial joyride through their opening ceremony, there's a guard shack now. And that's in addition to the slew of guards and police officers that monitor the front gate. Alex Jones entered through a back route. He literally swam through a swamp. <laughs> Probably met a lot of frogs. Sorry. The History Channel's Decoded certainly got a surprise when they tried to enter Bohemian Grove for themselves. And if you're interested in seeing that, follow for part three. This is part three talking about Bohemian Grove, a yearly California retreat for the most powerful among us, members of the Bohemian Club. The only way to go to the Bohemian Grove retreat is to either be a member or be a guest. And I'm just saying, guys, I'm not here. I wouldn't mind being a guest. Anyway, History Channel's Decoded got a lot more than they bargained for when they tried to go explore the Bohemian Grove retreat area. Immediately, they noticed security. Okay, well, Violators will be prosecuted. Yeah, but on the other hand, uh, there's a parking place up here and the gate is not shut. Even though they were on the middle of a very deserted road, they noticed all of the signs and security cameras. Now you have to really picture it. This is a place in the wilderness, essentially. A retreat hidden among the redwoods. And it's only used for two weeks out of the year. And yet, security showed up rather quickly. It's private property. Good to see you. Scott. Scott, nice to meet you. You can't take a look? Uh, no, it's private property. Wait, uh, are you a ranger? No, I work for the people that own this. We can't even just go right there. Within minutes, at even the non-active time, like the time that the members use the the facility, security descended. And not only security, police within minutes. There are a lot of implications there that can make the rest of us mad, so I'll just leave that hanging in the air. Yeah, back up, guys. How did you know we were here? Uh, somebody told me. Oh, they did? They dropped a dime? A little owl. Who told you? A little owl told you? <laughs> and are you going to now really, truly kick us off? Unfortunately, I have to ask you. It's a really fascinating episode, and I suggested it. it's on YouTube. It's called Decoded. There are those that feel that Bohemian Club and Bohemian Grove is not fair to the rest of us. They say if world leaders are making decisions about, about all of our lives, that we should be a party to it. I perhaps am more cynical just in general. 
This is a rich person's retreat. Poetry is read, plays are enacted, the arts, philosophy is all discussed. And that really comes from a history of, you know, the original history of a lot of secret societies that have kind of been infiltrated by the powerful when originally they were havens for philosophers from the powerful. My cynical take is that these people make choices about our lives anyway. And yes, in general, I agree. I would like to see more transparency, but I have no delusions that they wouldn't be making them with or without the Bohemian Grove retreat. So let me know how you feel in the comments below. Super weird one. Well, I am once again expecting mail from a secret society member, but this time from a Freemason. And in about a week, the orphanage too, but like, let's focus on Freemasonry right now. And surprisingly, as it is the oldest and most well-known, Freemasonry is like the one secret society I've yet to really delve into. And this is really because the topic is quite frankly enormous. Now it should be stated first that Freemasons don't really consider themselves a part of a secret society. And they say if it is a secret, it's one of the worst kept ones. So the term secret society is more of a colloquialism. And that's because of the secret practices and handshakes that occur behind closed doors in temples and lodges. Freemasonry originated in the Middle Ages and it was a guild of stonemasons. And building is still an integral part of the Freemason belief system. The connection between human architects and God are still paramount and they even refer to God as the Grand Architect. It's both surprising and unsurprising that so many, including the Catholic Church, consider Freemasonry satanic as so many so-called secret societies developed out of a need to discuss enlightenment away from the prying eyes of a dominantly conservative religious society. And this satanic panic, it endures, and it's fueled a lot by this secretive nature that people don't really know what's going on, and they see these kind of symbols on government buildings and all around the country. And these symbols actually have fairly mundane meanings. And if you want to know more about the Eye of Providence, which seems to be the one that really gets people riled up. I have a video about that if you want to scroll back. Now Masons must be men and so they're considered a fraternal society. Now they do have a separate but very different branch for women called the Order of the Eastern Sun. And this creates what is a very real concern that while Masons might care about religious equality that they haven't come a long way as far as inclusion. Many of the men in this fraternal society have been historical famous figures like Benjamin Franklin and Winston Churchill. But it's these powerful connections and exclusionary practices that lead some to be concerned. There are those that worry about the connections and the influence involved in Freemasonry. There are those that are calling for transparency because there is historical evidence that rich men doing secret things behind closed doors could lead to things not being so great for everybody else. Supporters of Freemasonry point to the very large charitable contribution they provide. A charitable contribution so large it's second only to the U.S. lottery in the United States. As always, I want to hear what you guys think in the comments below about Freemasonry. Hello and welcome back yet again to unboxing mail from a secret society. The secret society in question today being for the first time, Freemasonry secret. If you'd like a little backstory on why Freemasons are called a secret society when it's not entirely a secret and a little bit about their history, I do have a video right before this about that. And this box today comes to us from one of my friends from the shadows. <laughs> I have several friends from secret societies that I only know online and I don't know a lot about them personally and you guys will sometimes see them in my comments. So please stick around because I'm going to be unboxing it in just a second. Now this is probably the largest box I've received yet from any secret society member. And I have been told beforehand that every item in it is of significance to Freemasons. So let's open it up and see what's inside. Oh, you guys, this box was taped like all the way around. So <laughs> I spared you guys me opening it. All right, let's see what's in here. It kind of smells like metal <laughs> already. So something metal. Oh, wow. This must be the small thing they mentioned that was in here. This is gorgeous. Wow. I wore gloves. Please don't make fun of me. <laughs> I just, I, they said it was like really nice stuff and I just, I'm, whatever. The lost keys of Freemasonry. I will 100% read that. Thank you. Something in here smells really nice too, kind of incense-y. Now there's some sort of scroll. It's gonna be hard to unroll on camera, hang on. Guys, I am not an absolute expert in these things and my friend told me to consider each item a puzzle in itself. So it'll take me a while to figure out all the history. This is beautiful. I think this is maybe what I'm smelling. There's something that smells like incense. Actually, everything in this box is really beautiful. Oh, I know this painting. I teach this painting. This is Raphael's The School of Athens. And these kind of works about philosophers, um, it was a big reason that um, the Renaissance ended. This spot in the vanishing point that Aristotle and Plato are in had previously been reserved for Jesus. So there were all these concerns that like 
these new philosophy ideas and, you know, all of these scholars and painters replacing philosophy above religion. You see how one points to the heavens and one points down to earth? That was to show the schism in their philosophy. And also it said that, you know, there are lots of other philosophers in this painting. Um, but I think that there's a lot more to why he chose this painting. And I can get into that later if you guys want. This was absolutely beautiful. I greatly enjoyed it. Thank you for sending it to me so much. Thank you to all the Secret Society members that send me stuff. It's wonderful. And it's so fun. <laughs> Thank you. Now I've been reading and I'm sitting in front of my conspiracy board, so let's talk about the Order of Golden Dawn. Now's as good a time as any, right? The Order of Golden Dawn would flourish in the 19th and 20th century. Late 19th, early 20th. The Hermetic Order of Golden Dawn was a magical secret society, and it pulled much of its ideals from the mother of secret society mysticism, Rosicrucianism. It was founded by three Freemasons, and it began as so many things in secret societies do, with a cipher. In 1887, Freemason founder William Wynne Westcott managed to decode what are called the cipher manuscripts, and he used the mystic principles found within them to form a new order, the Order of the Golden Dawn. Similar to Freemasonry and its ranking system, but different in the fact that it allowed women. And both Rosicrucianism and the Order of the Golden Dawn would go on to be kind of umbrellas for, you know, all of these other mystical secret societies, like the still existing um, Ordo Templi Orientis. And the Order of the Golden Dawn practiced just about every form of magic that you can think of. Alchemy, tarot reading, astral projection. And they're said to have even inspired Thelemic principles in Wicca. And I can talk about Thelema, Thelema, I'm never quite sure, if you guys want another video, but that was Aleister Crowley's writings. And it too was inspired much by Rosicrucianism with that a little bit of Christian, a little bit of you know, Egyptian inspiration. But dissent would grow in the Order of the Golden Dawn. For a while, they seemed too high to touch. They had a thriving society of a hundred prominent members, including Bram Stoker and all of these other really well-known authors, and Aleister Crowley. You see, the founder, Westcott, said that only he could speak to something he called secret chiefs through the help of a psychic named Anna Sprengel. No one else ever met her. And these secret chiefs borrowed from the Islamic faith would only speak to her and knew all about mysticism. They were the premier source. And members were getting a little antsy that they couldn't speak to these secret chiefs too. And once Westcott was exposed for being a member and had to quit the order, people really started getting upset. For one, the society was passed on to another one of the original founders, Mathers. And Mathers was very good friends with this guy, Alistair Crowley who, as I said earlier, would go on to form his own order. And that's because nobody wanted him in the Order of the Golden Dawn. Mathers, despite objections, pushed Alistair through the rankings. And this would be the final straw that fractured the Order of the Golden Dawn. Today, you can see the marks they've left behind in Wicca and Thelema, but the actual order seems to no longer exist. However, in a cruel twist of irony, Aleister Crowley's Thelema has inspired several other secret societies that do persist, such as the Ordo Templi Orientis. Ellie Kemper today was trending on Twitter for not so good reasons. And as I went further down this rabbit hole, I realized that specifically Ellie Kemper was crowned the Veiled Prophet Queen in 1999. And as you guys know, my pet project in life is to research secret societies. And while we've talked about some secret societies, like the Odd Fellows, who have been unfairly maligned, we haven't talked a lot about secret societies that have political aspirations that are less than satisfactory, to put it very mildly. You see, secret societies are just like people. Some have very good intentions and some have very sinister intentions. So let's talk real quick about the uh, Veiled Prophet and let's also talk about a few other secret societies that are pretty terrible. Those from St. Louis are probably familiar with seeing the VP Fair every year on the 4th of July, which has now been renamed. The imagery and festivities were really similar to Mardi Gras, one of the more innocent things sewn into the fabric of the secret society. You see, unlike the independent order of Oddfellows, which was one of the first and most intentionally integrated by gender and race secret societies, this secret society was founded for very unsavory reasons. Veiled Prophet was founded in 1878 by a Confederate cavalryman. It was to organize a meeting of the elites and to keep the rich businessmen of St. Louis in power. The Veiled Prophet himself was to be a mystic traveler. And this board of elite businessmen would choose a different Veiled Prophet, and that Veiled Prophet would choose a queen at a ball, which is where Ellie Kemper comes in. But at its founding, the Veiled Prophet was a flex of power. It was a response to labor unrest and railroad strikes. 
strikes. The Great Railroad Strike of 1877 saw racially united workers. And this was unthinkable to the elites of the city. Because, you know, they were asking for very ridiculous things, like no more child labor. As for why it's being called you know, the KKK. That has to do with this imagery, which does predate the Ku Klux Klan, and of course that the founder was a confederate. Now, the Veiled Prophet did integrate in the 70s, but a lot of people are understandably uncomfortable with its origins, especially when you consider in recent years one of the only unveilings of one of the prophets was the Monsanto VP, showing that there's still some power there. Now, you might say, Rachel, are there other terrible secret societies in history? Of course. The worst that comes to my mind is Thule, an occultist society that sponsored the National Socialist Germans Workers Party. If I had more time, I would go more deeply into it, and I can if you guys want me to in another video. But again, secret societies are formed for all kinds of different reasons. There have been a fair few number of Irish secret societies, such as the Ribbon Society, that were pro-labor, and specifically fought for tenant rights. Now, this video is not a judgment call on Ellie Kemper herself. Those in St. Louis say that her family is very powerful and would want to keep the status quo. I don't know how she personally feels. But as we've seen throughout the years, many celebrities get to be that way because their family has a lot of money. And it can be disappointing to that image we have in our heads of, you know, somebody waiting tables to make it big. Curious to hear what you guys think. All right, I've been told not to talk about it so many times that I gotta talk about it. That's who I am as a person. If you can't accept, I don't know what to tell you. And that's the skull and bones. People have repeatedly told me to avoid mentioning the skull and bone, including Freemasons. In fact, quite a few Freemasons. And I briefly brought it up before, but let's dive into what it is. This will probably take me a few parts. Skull and Bones is the most commonly known name for the secret society at Yale, but they do have a number of aliases, which by itself to me is a little suspicious. The Order, Order 322, and the Brotherhood of Death. The skull and Bones was founded in 1832 and originally had 14 members. There are many conspiracy theories around it, and I'm not here for that. I'm just going to tell you what we know as far as the facts. I don't really like to go too far into that kind of stuff. But I will tell you that the conspiracy Conspiracy theories come from the fact that there have been quite a few powerful members in Skull and Bones. For some reason, George W. Bush is the one that's brought up the most. Members are known as Bonesmen, members of the Order, or initiated to the Order. Now, like most secret societies we've talked about, uh, Skull and Bones was originally just men. But they have accepted women since 1990. Part two of talking about the Skull and Bones, the most famous secret society at Yale. So in the first part, we kind of established just when they were, you know, founded and what they are. Now let's talk a little bit about the conspiracy theories, which I'm not endorsing or saying I believe, just if you're curious, and where they meet. Skull and Bones meets at this uh, place called the Tomb, which as you can see here was built in 1856. They also own and manage an island retreat called Deer Island if you want to pause to read, used to be beautiful, but it's now basically just ruins. Now, some of the theories around Skull and Bones are that it's involved in the CIA, that it was somehow involved in the Kennedy assassination, and that it's part of the Illuminati. I think it's important to note that the Illuminati was an actual secret society at one point, and not anything like what people say it is. Now, the CIA theory comes from the fact that one of the famous members was head of the CIA, James Jesus Angleton. But it's important to remember that these kind of clubs, which is mostly still a boys club, really exist for powerful people to be connected. So it doesn't necessarily have connection. All over part th three about the skull and bone. Part three about the skull and bone. Now here's kind of an interesting thing, which is since I've been talking about secret societies, a lot of people message me about them, like that actually have some information. And I will say one thing I found kind of interesting is that somebody said, you know, as a Freemason, that it being only men kind of allows the members to open up. They have a safe emotional space. However, the Skull and Bones does have a history of discrimination against women and minorities. So the Skull and Bones is run by an alumni trust called the Russell Trust. When Skull and Bones started allowing black members in 1965, they openly opposed now, this is a really powerful trust that basically oversees the admission of people to the group. So not cool, my dude. They also tried to sue when women started being admitted in 1991. So not cool. If those things aren't bad enough, Skull and Bones also has a very famous skull that was stolen by a group when George W. Bush was there of Apache Chief Geronimo. An interesting thing about members is that they are assigned secret names based on myths and history. Odin, Hamlet, and so on. All of Report 4 Initiations. This is part four of the Skull and Bones talking about initiations, and I'm going to try to say these things as um, family-friendly as possible, but adult content warning. 18 plus, please. Now, there's no exact proof of any of these things, because members of Skull and Bones are extremely secretive, especially even compared to other secret societies. But the biggest rumor about their initiation is um, that members must get inside of a coffin and give themselves some love in the biblical sense, and recount all of their um, experiences with partners. And then if they do that, they're given $15,000. 
I've heard of worse things. Inside of the tomb is a secret room called the Inner Temple or Room 322. The inside of the tomb is described as campy, kind of like the Adams Family. And the Inner Tomb houses manuscripts, the most secretive of which is the initiation rituals. Skull and Bones, unusually, is a dry secret society to keep members level-headed. So while it's somewhere between a haunted house and a frat, it's always impressed on members that they're the next leaders of the world. I'm deep down the secret society rabbit hole again. This time because of one of y'all, one of my very mysterious followers here on TikTok, who pointed me to a group called the Odd Fellows. I read about the Odd Fellows until I fell asleep last night, and this is the result, and I still don't fully understand. The Odd Fellows are similar to the Orphanage or the Freemasons in that their their messaging is full of esoteric symbols, and their art bang and love it would hang it in my house. The Odd Fellows are actually one of the oldest fraternal organizations, but there's no great documentation before the 18th century about how they even assembled. Oh, look at the art. Sorry, I'll get back on track. One of the symbols for the Odd Fellows are three rings interlocking, which represent friendship, love, and truth. It's called the Triple Links. Shout out to Messy Nessie for the greatest overview. Messy Nessie speculates that those principles would have been really odd at the time of their foundation. While they seem like a kind organization, controversy erupted years ago when skeletons were found in all of the walls of their lodges. I'm Rachel, and if you're new here, I like to poke the bear that are this country's great secret societies. Today we're talking about the Odd Fellows, one of the oldest secret organizations ever. Older, but less well known than the Freemasons. Now, the Odd Fellows principles are really nice. They're all about kindness and truth and, you know, helping people. And at first, when I was reading about them, I thought, yeah, there's really nothing here, until I read this article from the LA Times. This article's from 2001. And y'all, it's all about how they had skeletons and, like, real skeletons, human remains inside of all the walls of their lodges, right? So it says, Paul Wallace was alone repairing overloaded circuits in an old brick building when he discovered a tiny door to a dark recess between two walls. Inside was a black wooden box. Curious Wallace tugged it from the resting place. A white shroud appeared, leathery ribs and white candles. So it's like a whole kit with an actual skeleton. The article goes on to say that the Oddfellows stash skeleton skulls, things like that, inside of drawers and closets, all, all inside their lodges, many have been found. Members say it's no one's business. This is the Odd Fellows part. Odd Fellows part three. Okay, so let's talk about why the Odd Fellows have skeletons in their walls, closets, attics. Well, they use them in their initiation rituals, but nobody's quite sure like why or how. What people do know is that they're being found more and more in very surprising ways. And that there are many people that think, you know, this has got to have some level of disrespect to these actual people because these are real people and they had loved ones or have loved ones. As you can see here in the LA Times in this article about this, they say the skeletons have sparked police investigations in Missouri, Indiana, Pennsylvania, Nebraska. Look, a work crew fleed in terror from finding one by accident in Oklahoma. And if we look to the bottom of the screenshot, we can see that this man was offered two caskets from a disbanding lodge from you know, the Odd Fellows. And he thought, you know, great, uh, props, Halloween, whatever, and they had actual skeletons in them. Most members remained closed-lipped even when speaking to police, but a few opened up with the caveat, don't tell. 